and welcome to the HIPAA Survival Guides Director's Cut. I'm John Nelson and I'm joined today as always by Carlos Leva, the author of the HIPAA Survival Guide and as always as well Martin Gwynn, our Director of Operations here at HSG. Today's episode is Quantum Physics and Espresso, or Espresso and Quantum Physics. They go hand in hand. And uh, this is kind of an interesting title we've got today. So, Carlos, let's start right here. What do quantum physics have to do with uh, the Espresso product from the Hipper Survivor Guide? So, you know, there is a little uh, something mathematical about um, how we went about, sort of tangentially mathematical about how we went about uh, solving the problem that we think we solve with espresso. It's not really quantum physics, but uh, we're, you know, we're, we're having a little fun here. And, you know, I, I just thought maybe that, 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 um, that Martin could elaborate a little bit more as to whether Schrodinger's cat was alive or dead, or how could he be both alive and dead at the same time? And you don't know until you open the box whether he's alive or dead. You well, kind of you shake the ball. box, you get a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you could shake the box and you would tell you something, right? Absolutely. I, I have to remind everyone, no one, uh, no animals were injured in the making of this video. Yeah. <laughs> carrying this out. Um, okay, so, yeah, it wasn't quite quantum physics, but there is a, a part of, uh, espresso that's a, a tautology, something that's, you know, mathematically, you know, and as a logical um, concept of tautology is something that's kind of true by definition. As you, you might want to, uh, would be a layperson sort of definition. This is true uh, by definition, okay? And when we started pulling um, the rationalizing the pieces of espresso and you know uh, figuring out how we were going to uh, attack this thing because you start looking at threats and you know you go to IBM's X Force database and they got 400,000 ways and growing as to you know how somebody could penetrate your network okay and yeah, obviously that was an impossible task to do deal with 400,000 different threat vectors and, you know, uh, if you just look at social engineering, there's probably thousands at least of ways that, that you can be socially engineered out of your credentials and other access um, things that you have that will then let the bad guys get in. And so part of what we did and part of what the NIST model supports, now you know, for those of you who are hearing about Espresso for the first time, we built it on uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology Special Publications uh, 800-30 Rev. 1, which is uh, essentially NIST recommendations for how you conduct a risk assessment. And this is in the business of, it's a government agency, but it's in the business of, um, in part, because it does a lot more than this, advising other government agencies how they should comply with certain regulations. And in this case, uh, they were advising uh, organizations, other government organizations, how to do a risk assessment. And it really had nothing to do specifically with HIPAA. Yeah, this is a model, um, this is a model that can be used across industries, okay? But it is the, the go-to model that everybody in the HIPAA space that has tried to sort of productize and come up with a way of reducing the pain of doing a risk assessment has used, okay? And so we uh, use that as well, okay? And one of the things that uh, SP30 says is that, you know, you can aggregate. It's okay. You can aggregate uh, threats. You can aggregate vulnerabilities. And and if you thought about this problem for very long, you knew that really the only, the only way you could get your mind around this problem was to aggregate it. So, we actually come up with like nine different threats, but those threats, let's say that the first one is, uh, and the first one is social engineering or intrusion, okay? Now what we do is we pre-populate Espresso with these threats, vulnerabilities, risks, and we'll talk more about that, but to start with the threat, social engineering or intrusion could 
readily encompass hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of threat vectors. Okay, and right, and so we we said, okay, well, all those are one now, one threat vector: social engineering intrusion, and then you know weather, and you know so on down the list. Where well, we came up with nine essentially categories of threats. Okay, but those categories really represented lots and lots and lots of threat vectors. Okay, and then we said, well, okay, those are the threats, and it's a pretty, pretty broad and representative set that would apply across almost all organizations you could think of. Certainly, covenant entities and business associates would be included in that, that they would be um, implicated in social engineering, intrusion, weather, etc. So well, what are the what are the threats? So the big sort of epiphany that we had, when the light really went on, is that this idea that John actually coined of matter and antimatter, but the fact that in in the HIP security rule there are um, twenty nine implementation specifications. Now implementation specifications it's probably just a quaint term that maybe people in the computer field, computer security field, used back in 1996 when uh, HIPAA was first promulgated. Uh, and and people don't know that it was promulgated under Clinton, under Clinton, and it actually didn't go into effect uh, until um, in, in, until George Bush was president in 2004, 2005. Uh, but it, but it was signed into law. It had a long implementation cycle. It was signed into law in 1996. And it turns out that implementation specifications are really nothing more than what security professionals today call controls. All right? And the short definition of a control is something that reduces risk uh, to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. At least that would be the definition for, it, for the security rule. But, but so the 29 implementation specifications are really nothing more than controls. You can think of them that way. And so they are things that you do and you're required to do in order to reduce risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. Well, if, for example, the security rule says that you have to have a disaster recovery plan, which it does, and you don't, then that lack of a plan became a vulnerability. No disaster recovery plan becomes a vulnerability, okay? And it becomes a vulnerability that you cure by implementing this control, which is, which comes out of the security rule. So, right, you cure the lack of no disaster recovery plan by creating a disaster recovery plan. And so that matter, antimatter, right, that, that approach to vulnerabilities and controls sort of being kind of like mirror images uh, but function conceptually in different ways was what allowed us to say, oh, if we take this approach, and this approach seems valid because the more we looked at it, the more we realized that the implementation specifications were nothing more than controls. Now, it may seem obvious in hindsight, it may seem obvious now that we're pointing that out, but I've been working with uh, HIPAA for, uh, I don't know how many years now, since 2009, and it, it certainly wasn't obvious to me, you know, before we started working on Espresso and before we started thinking, how are we really going to attack this problem, okay? And so the reason we can say that Espresso is, if you do what's identified in Espresso, it's a tautology, it's, you'll be in compliance by definition, okay? is that Espresso identifies those 29 controls that are the same exact 29 controls that you have to implement to be in compliance with the security rule. Therefore, if you implement these 29 controls, you are by definition in compliance. Okay, and so what Espresso did and does is rationalize this environment of threats and vulnerabilities and put these pieces together and created 150 risks right out of the box in, in a, a baseline risk assessment. And to those risks were assigned certain controls 
that would mitigate those risks and those controls came right out of the security rule. So that's sort of the, you know, it's not quite mathematics, but there was a this conceptual framework that was sort of math-like in the sense that you had this puzzle that had to conceptually fit. And what we found is when our customers get the puzzle, when, when they finally see it, um, then they say, ah, we understand what you guys have done here. Now, um, and John, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this one and, and, you know, I know you, you, you're usually the one asking the questions, but really the intent of these um, director's cut is to generate a conversation is, so why don't you explain sort of a little bit about how the, how the, how controls work to be the bridge between risks and, and security objects? Right, right. Well, um, there's there's a lot to unpack there, and I, actually, there's there's a lot to go over just just in what you've already covered. Um, controls, really, uh, just to reiterate and get us grounded here. Controls, w what's being controlled is actually the vulnerability. That's the the antimatter to the vulnerabilities matter. They cancel each other out, right? Or at least matter and antimatter cancel each other out and release tremendous energy. But here, the control is canceling out. Or at least, or at least putting the dampers on the vulnerabilities in question, and that's how you actually you control the you control the risks by controlling the vulnerabilities by eliminating that vulnerability. So, so with your example, uh, Carlos of disaster recovery plan, a threat might be you know um, might be anything that like social engineering or intrusion that that affects your ability to operate in a disaster, and so that threat of intrusion is exploiting the fact that you haven't conducted, that you haven't developed a disaster recovery plan. So that is one particular risk, that threat of intrusion exploiting the vulnerability of you haven't sat down to do a plan. And the control is to actually sit down and do a plan so that threat won't be able to exploit uh, the fact that you haven't developed a plan because you have developed a plan. You have figured out how to operate in an emergency without um, <clears throat> without the adverse effects that the risk presents. Correct. And that and in that case that case and there's multiple ways of, of looking at this, but in that case the the you know the threat vector is intrusion. The intruder could come in and delete all your data. You don't have backups of your data and obviously it's not just your electronic health records that are part of your uh, personal health information, but all the images you have on your network and even personal health information you have in Word documents and PowerPoints, whatever, all of that now after the omnibus rule is considered to be personal health information. If that all of a sudden got deleted and you didn't have backups of it, then, then you're in big trouble, right? Now, now right. so and that's really, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. And, and that really that really brings us to the bridge because so far we've been talking very abstractly you know we've been analogizing to quantum physics quantum mechanics and talking about risks and you know sort of at, from a broad view well a disaster recovery plan there's intrusion and we've already discussed that intrusion itself probably encompasses a million different things so that, that's all very very broad and abstract and the bridge here that controls actually play is bringing that abstraction into the concrete, the re, uh, the reality of where we are right now. So that, those documents that you have, the uh, all the information on your server, whether it be your PHI server or just your mail server. I mean, that's all information that is is really what your operation is. Your operation is a collection of things, uh, people, processes, and. Uh, and when you implement a control, you're you're not just uh, solving the the abstract problem. You're not you're not in Plato's cave anymore. You're saying how can we actually uh, protect this word file uh, or this particular piece of PHI or ePHI and actually make it um, put in our in our backup servers. How are we going to? How often are we going to back up? Where are we going to back up to? And actually dealing with the real information in in implementing that plan that you've already had all of these nice big thoughts about and really put it down uh, into use. Right, and and th that's a great example because when I when I um, because it's different 
right? It, it's different than the example that I that I tend to use uh, for a number of reasons. Is is when I think of disaster recovery plan, my threat is you know Katrina, some weather event, right? And it was you know a, right. a, a disaster of uh, you know great magnitude, right? And and its impact is not only affecting you but every everything and everyone around you, right? And some high percentage of medical offices, like at least 70% or more, were uh, lost files during Katrina. And and the same thing was true for um, for 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 legal um, offices is, is that most lawyers lost almost all their files. The Fifth Circuit in downtown New Orleans had a lot of files in their uh, basement that, that were, were totally lost. And you can imagine the, the confusion uh, that ensued. But the, one of the things that it points out here is that the, having no disaster recovery plan, that vulnerability applies to this threat, social engineering or intrusion, but that same vulnerability also applies to a weather event like Katrina. And so you will see that, you know, that, that multiple um, vulnerabilities, which are the things like John likes to point out uh, and does a good job of pointing out, is the thing, the vulnerabilities are, is the thing that controls are, are, are going to plug, they're going to fix, that they're going to attack. You'll see multiple uh, places where the vulnerability of a disaster recovery plan comes up. And so, so do some of the other 29 controls that the security rule identifies. Now, I should say one thing about this concept of a control. HHS is now even taken to using the word controls instead of implementation specifications when they talk about the latter. Now, just to say a brief um, review, the security rule has standards, okay, and then underneath those standards, they have one or more well, they have zero or more. Usually, uh, every standard has at least one implementation specifications. There are a few standards that don't have any, and we treat that standard just as it being the implementation specification itself. But usually, there's a standard, and then there's one or more implementation specifications, i.e., controls that you have to implement to meet that standard. Okay, and some of the implementation specifications are labeled required. Some of them are labeled addressable. The addressable ones don't mean that they're optional. They just mean implement the specification as written or implement an alternative, or you better have a damn good reason why you don't implement anything. So we don't want to go with this is not a security rule sort of uh, director's cut here, but we took the 29 controls, and we didn't care whether they were addressable or required. We said this is, this is the scope of the security rule. And if you if you uh, remediate, if you mitigate, if you uh, uh, implement these controls, you are by definition going to be in compliance with the security rule. Right. And I think that and that's how. That, and and that's really how Expresso goes about it. It treats every. It really puts all the controls on the same playing field. And uh, and it's true that multiple um, the the same threat might exploit. Uh, many different vulnerabilities. Intrusion could could affect your disaster recovery plan. It could affect the fact that uh, you can't um, that, that maybe your two-factor authentication won't work if if they've changed some data. Uh, so now you can't get into your own files. Uh, so actually, in Expresso, with that 150 number of risks, and each risk is just one combination of a, th a single threat exploiting a single vulnerability. Uh, that's a that's one little threat there, and we have 150 of them. So that's a combination of nine threats exploiting a mixture of 29 vulnerabilities. So uh, that nine and 29 it averages out to I think 16 and two thirds of uh, vulnerabilities that each threat 
uh, could potentially exploit. So, uh, so that's where we then come full circle with going back from the high level of we've got these risks out there and threats and vulnerabilities down to the concrete of, well, we actually have Tom's phone who uh, we've implemented a two-factor authentication. We need to implement that on Tom's phone. That's where the control that you that we were talking about with the risk actually comes into play with Tom's phone, and you can not only connect the control with the risk in Expresso itself, but you can also connect the control with Tom's phone because Expresso also incorporates your or has the ability to incorporate all of all of the stuff that you got your workforce members, your inventory, your processes, and you can connect the individual controls to those individual objects. So controls really is, is and, and, and I love this metaphor, um, and, and, and kudos to John for, uh, for initially foreseeing it in this particular way, is the bridge from this abstraction, and you know, it's not our abstraction, it's and this is abstraction of how you deal with a risk and how you calculate a risk and the fact that if somebody says, well, define a risk, well, you know, a risk, the semantic meaning of a risk is a threat vulnerability pair, okay? And then, and then conceptually dealing with the fact that if this threat actually did exploit this vulnerability, what would be the impact to your organization? And then that equals the risk, and you are, you're assigning probability levels and impact levels. Uh, first of all, you assign probability level to the threat actually exploiting the risk, high, medium, or low. And then you assign uh, an impact level as to whether if this did occur, then what kind of impact would it have to your organization? So obviously, if Katrina happened, that impact to your organization would be high. But if you had you know, a backup generator and you didn't have all your files in a place that could get flooded and you had, you know, uh, your backup on the cloud. I mean, there were many, many ways that you could say, okay, we, we kind of, we have this plan, we've tested this plan, we think that uh, because of our implementation of the control, even though the impact would be disastrous, we feel like the risk is medium, not high. Right, and there are other there are other risks that you may say. Well, we think that the risk is the impact is high, but the risk is actually low because the control is. We believe the control is that effective in reducing the risk. Okay, but the the epiphany is that when our clients see the fact that they now understand exactly what they have to do to comply with the security rule. That's sort of comforting because they're not been guessing anymore. And one of the things that gets lost um, to one of our colleagues, or actually our CFO, reminded me the other day is, uh, you know, because we've been living with this thing for a while, we've been living with this problem, thinking about how to solve it for a while, is that, that Espresso was designed by lawyers that had um, also a pretty darn good understanding of technology and had uh, lots of experience, in fact were you know, nationally recognized authorities on the regulations and had been teaching thousands of people how to go about complying with this stuff for a long, long time. And despite the fact that we started with that advantage, it was still, uh, it was still a hard sort of problem to solve when the fit, when, when, when the you know, with respect to today's director's because when the physics finally came together, when the pieces of the puzzle kind of fell out, it was like, ah, this is, you know, there was this aha moment. It was like, really, is this as good as we think it is? I mean, is this solve the problem? And what the feedback that we've gotten from our customers is when they get to this moment, and it doesn't take them that long to get to this moment, they have the same epiphany. Now, in Espresso, you can use Espresso, and you should use Espresso to um, manage a lot more risk over time. The threat landscape is going to be changing, right? And Espresso allows you to add controls that have nothing to do with the security rule, okay? But are so it helps you solve. Um, well, it, it helps you. It gives you a tool for solving a much 
bigger problem, but our baseline espresso risk assessment that comes pre-populated with this uh, information, these threats, vulnerabilities, and controls was to allow you a quicker way to understand what the challenge was in implementing um, implementing the controls that the security rule required so that you could be in compliance, right? That was our mission, to have you be in compliance. Uh, and then the rest of, and what we're now calling Espresso Plus Plus, the rest of our products, 30 some odd products, are products that help you implement the controls. So for example, security rule says you need to train your staff. Well, we have over 15 training products. You know, security rule says you ought to have policies and procedures, and, and we have, uh, policies and procedures for the security rule, the privacy rule, the breach notification rule, the cloud, social media. Now, the, you know, those other ones aren't really, um, they're subsets of the problem, but they're so nuanced that we believe that people need to have policies and procedures. So once Espresso helps you identify what it is that you're supposed to do, the rest of our products help you with the most important step. It's is which is actually the doing, the remediating, the actual fixing. So you got to remember that by definition, in the NIST uh, methodology, that an assessment is a pure analysis step. It's not really where you fix anything. It's where you identify what should be fixed. Now, despite the fact that we we say you can do a risk analysis. Um, or risk assessment in three hours or less. The reason that you can do that risk assessment in three hours or less is that we spent thousands of hours rationalizing this environment, matching threats with vulnerabilities, attaching them to controls so that your job is to go through those 150 risks and think really, really hard about what would happen if this threat actually exploited this vulnerability. Okay, what's the probability of that? What's the impact of that? and then coming up with a risk level, okay? And then when you're done with that exercise, you can produce this report that's the master risk assessment report that you can produce, that you can produce to a, uh, an, an auditor or to a court of law saying, this is visible demonstrable evidence that I've conducted a risk assessment, okay? Now the show doesn't stop there, right? Because that's just an, an, an analysis step, but it should, um, and it does, in reality, make our customers feel really, really good that they have a, a solid foundation because now they know and they've identified in a relatively short period of time uh, what, what they have to do to comply. Okay? And so in addition to Espresso making that identification, we have things like the privacy rule checklist which goes through every single requirement of the privacy rule and gives you three things. It gives you a suggested policy for that particular requirement, a suggested set of processes that you should implement that underpin that requirement, or that, that underpin that policy, okay, and a suggested set of tracking mechanisms that help you uh, capture process results. All right, so if you have policies and you have processes that underpin the policy, and you have the ability to track process results at the granularity level of a requirement, then you have visible demonstrable evidence of that requirement. And so although, although it would be an overstatement to say that, that the rest of our products have everything you need to remediate, it's not, a, it's not an overstatement or hyperbole to say with our checklist, we will walk you through every single one of the requirements and give you suggestions as to how you should go about complying with each requirement. Now, it turns out that the breach notification rule is a little bit different um, in the sense that if you look at the OCR protocol for the breach notification rule, it's a sense, it's a set of 10 to 12 preparedness requirements. You have model letters in place. You have an analytical framework to determine when breach is triggered. Do you know what media to contact, et cetera, et cetera? And our breach notification framework actually helps you fulfill those requirements. So those are the three rules. Those are the three things that you have to uh, comply with, privacy rule, security rule, and the breach notification rule. So Espresso helps you identify, 
the rest of our products help you sort of remediate. So, you know, what we hear back from our clients is that that they have a pretty complete package here that helps them address the problem. Okay. Is, is there anything, you know, um, you know, uh, out there that's com that is a complete 100% solution? We don't think that exists, right? We 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 think that for twenty five hundred dollars, what our what our subscription is, you could spend ten times more and probably get probably get less value. Now we got hundreds of people now using Espresso, uh, and Martin, I think that's the count, right? We've got well over a hundred. Yes, yes, it is, and um, everybody that we work with just loves it. I mean, especially the IT guys; they understand it, they get it, and they jump on it. And John, you've been testing 1.1 1 .1, uh, that we're about to release in January. So why don't you just give us a quick rundown on what the principal features are in 1.1? .1. Well, the main highlight feature is uh, the ability to add controls uh, at every level of the security object tree. So in order to explain that and why it's cool, we need to understand the security object tree just a little bit. It's not too complicated. So. It's broken down into into a couple different levels. So there are categories of security objects, which might be something like uh, devices or uh, or people. And then within each category, there are different classes of security objects. So with people, you might have workforce members or um, or contractors or subcontractors, what have you. So so that's that's the basic structure, and and that winds up in four different levels of the tree. So you've got all of your security objects, every category that there is. So your devices, your workforce members, and everything else. So all categories. And then if you go down a step, you're looking at a single category like devices. And then go down another step and you're looking at a single class, which might be something like PCs or uh, pads or phones, or servers, things like that. So then you're looking at a single class. And then within that, the very bottom of the tree is is your little snowflake, your your little objects themselves. So that would be my phone, Carlos's phone, Martin's phone, etc. So that's the structure. You've got these categories and classes, with which winds up in four levels of the security object tree. And in version 1.0 of Expresso, you can only add a control to the little snowflakes, the individual security objects which um, and now uh, in version 1.1 you can add controls at any level of the tree so that's in in some controls are actually it makes sense to do that for instance uh, there's one control uh, that we have in Expresso called uh, conduct an accurate and thorough risk assessment and so on and so forth it's a specification directly out of the HIPAA act and uh, that really, I mean, that might be a great example of a control that applies to everything. So instead of going through each individual object that you've got, you can, at your highest level of the tree, when you're looking at all of your categories and classes, just go into controls, click one button, and it cascades. It, it, that control is now assigned to everything. Or if you don't want to be that drastic, you can just go to whatever level it's appropriate for. So some uh, control might be appropriate for an entire class of things like phones, but might not be appropriate for your workforce members over over there in your um, in your person's category. So that is the main feature that we're looking forward to saving our customers a lot of time from having to click, 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 click all over the place just to really do the same thing to a bunch of different things. And John, is that tree that you talk about, is that is that is that fixed in structure or can the customers change that or how does that work? Uh, we set everyone up with that structure that I just explained, but uh, anyone's free to change it. And now you're free to edit it or to add to it. We do not uh, let you delete anything from it. You can change it to your heart's desire or add to it to your heart's desire, but we don't let you delete anything for uh, for the security and preservation of, of records concerns that we have expressed for for months now. So you can actually, if you don't like calling uh, calling a category persons and you want to call it people or vice versa, go ahead. If you want to add more categories or more classes within a category and say, well, I mean, I've started off with uh, with workforce like employees and contractors, but that's I need to I need to split it up more than that. Feel free. 
So um, part of the and the reason this is why we were having a little fun, but the reason why you know the, the, we chose this quantum physics is just a little bit of the alchemy of you know how we can make this claim that you can do a risk assessment in three hours or less is a we you know we we've rationalized the problem for you. We left the heavy lifting for you that only you can do is to think about really hard about these risks and the probability levels and the impact of your organization. We obviously can't do that for you, nor do we attempt to do that for you, right? We just built this edifice that allows you to do that, but uh, we also do not require, and the rules do not require, that you import, and Espresso allows you to import your inventory if you put it in the CSV format that we specify. It doesn't require you to import all your security objects and take all this inventory prior to doing a risk assessment. There is no rule in the regulations that says before you do a risk assessment, you got to have all your inventory in place. Now, if you read uh, 800 SP 30 Rev 1, that is the first step of creating a risk assessment. That is, ultimately, you want to be able to take these abstract risks and take these controls and apply them phys to physical objects, which we allow you to do. But for certain controls, maybe a lot of the security rule controls, they apply to all all objects. And at the end of the day, nobody wins. This is not about you know conducting the most perfect risk assessment and getting an A for it. It's identifying those controls that you're going to implement to reduce risk to reasonable to levels that are reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size, complexity, uh, etc. The real doing, the real A is going out and mitigating in the real world, applying those controls that we talked about in the real world to real world objects. Okay? What we don't force you to do it is we don't force you to apply it into the espresso abstraction before you can do the risk assessment because our firm belief was, hey, identify the controls and go out there and get started remediating, go out there and get started mitigating, and then you can come back and sort of tidy up the paperwork and say, okay, yes, these controls went to these objects and sort of that, but that's that's sort of like a cleanup activity, right? And so you don't have to go through this long, you know, month-long or six-month-long inventory process before you do your first risk assessment. The other reason why, um, you know, we felt that this approach uh, was useful in, in, as far as um, actually going through and dealing with the hardest part of this stuff is dealing with the risk is that going through and dealing with the risk and understanding what a control is, et cetera, et cetera, going through that process dramatically increases your literacy level as to what you're doing, as to what the regulations uh, requires. So espresso in and of itself, part of the alchemy and by intent, because we've been we've been training thousands of people in our free webinars for over eight years now, right? And once a month we've been doing this in our newsletters. The whole intent was to teach, right? And what we find is that our that our clients climb the HIPAA security rule learning curve so much faster after they go through that first risk assessment. In fact, before they even get through their first one, the light starts to come on as to what it is that what it is that they have to do. So there is um, for various reasons I think a little bit of alchemy here that supports and underpins uh, our marketing claims that you can do a risk assessment in three hours or less. Obviously if you were starting with blank sheets of papers and we hadn't spent thousands of hours trying to rationalize this environment and even more hours producing products that help you remediate that, that would be in a, a near impossible um, task. But, but with that... It stands now. It does, um, it does actually save you a lot of time. And if I can just briefly uh, mention a couple other features I'm excited about to save you sure. time for sure. version 1.1. Controls are also a lot easier to navigate through when you're not actually looking at the control itself. When you're trying to figure out what to pair, 
uh, a, if you're looking at a security object and trying to figure out which controls to pair with it, or looking at a risk, what controls do I put with this risk, it's now a lot easier to get to the full text of both the act uh, out on the HIPAA survival guide to navigate through that without losing where you are in risks, because we had some customers mention that it could be a lot more streamlined if we if we allow that capability to go and go and see what the control is without losing your place. So now you, you have the ability to do that in 1.1, and also saving you clicks when you're going through your risk assessment in three hours or less, you're going risk one, two, three, four, five, now in 1.1 you don't have to back out to the main screen anymore to get to your next risk. You can just fly right from one risk to the next to the next, saving you just a little bit more time there as well. Well, that's, uh, that's great that you said that, John, because it reminds me of something that I wanted to talk about is that I wonder if we shouldn't start shipping the load file. Because one of the things now is that, that Espresso will load um, uh, the risk will be named Espresso Risk 00100 so they sort in ASCII order. Now, um, you know, that our, 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 our clients went in there and did that and figured it out that, hey, it would be easier for us if we just went and had them sort in this particular way. But um, but our initial clients also discovered that, that the way the risk and the threats and vulnerabilities were loaded they were loaded in that particular order so that a threat and its nine vulnerabilities were associated and so if you were if you numbered them zero zero one zero zero two zero zero three it made it a lot easier to deal with those risks as a set and yeah. now yeah. and now in 1.1 they automatically come numbered that way so we've you know we've listened to the marketplace we've added uh, a number of features I think that our clients are going to like, like adding notes to uh, risks. Uh, formally, you could add notes to security objects. You could add notes, and by notes, we just mean freeform text to threats, to impacts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we had neglected that you probably the biggest object, you know, that we had the risks that allow notes to be added to risk, and now um, now you can add notes uh, to risks. And so 1.1. Testing is looking really, really good right now. We think, you know, we don't see anything that will stop us from shipping in early January. We're really excited about that. And I um, want to thank you for listening to Espresso and Quantum Physics. Martin, do you have anything um, you want to add? Well, I think shaking the box with the cat in it was good because a lot of interesting and valuable information came out through this today. Part of your plan all along. That's the way I had it planned, yep. <laughs> Have you done that experiment with the cat? I mean, I don't. It's beyond me, man. I, you know, I don't. I don't. You know, I had to go back and think. Well, well you know, it's it's just. I, well, well, you know, one of the things that um, not to digress too far, but this came out today with a a call. And this Martin, this is something you might want to help this out with. Um, they came out with a call for uh, cryptology. Algorithms that would um, that would work on quantum computers because the, their fear is that in two or three years quantum computers will actually be a real thing and quantum computers are such a leap in computational power that they will render current encryption encryption uh, algorithms useless useless right they'll, they'll be broken too easily. Uh, and so they're they're in dire need of somebody with your knowledge. <laughs> I, I give it some thought. Um, they haven't called yet. I generally like them to call first. It makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't called you yet. I'm sure no. you're right on the list, man. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of people on list today, but uh, uh, I'll just wait for the call. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for having a little fun with us, Espresso and Quantum Physics. That's our director's cut for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.